Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to week 12. This week we'll be talking about citizenship, civil liberties, and immigration, thinking about the rights and protections that are guaranteed to all American citizens, all citizens of the United States, and the process of becoming a citizen, of, of immigrating and naturalizing uh, as, you, as a citizen of the United States. Uh, this first lecture for the week will focus on civil liberties. So we're going to define what civil liberties are, talk about the civil liberties protected by the Bill of Rights, and then think a little bit about the politics of civil liberties. So what are civil liberties? Well, the basic definition of a civil liberty is these are the limitations placed on government power that they protect freedoms that governments may not legally intrude upon. It's important to note that um, the United States Constitution uses the language of persons, not citizens. So the idea is that these are rights that are guaranteed to all persons, protections against uh, government action by the US federal government for all persons, not just citizens. It's a broader conception of civil liberties. And we often um, distinguish civil liberties from civil rights, which we'll talk about next week. Um, but civil rights concerns kind of equal treatment under the law of all persons, regardless of race, gender, national origin, religion. Liberties are more about the, the um, kind of the freedoms that you have, the protections against government interference. And we often think of civil liberties stemming, stemming from what's known as the liberal tradition of political thought. People like John Locke, John Stuart Mill, John Rawls, Ronald Dworkin. Um, and the idea here is that a liberty here is to create what's known as a zone of non-interference, or you can think of it as a wall of separation around the individual that separates the individual from government action. They, they, civil liberties provide a kind of force field against government intrusion. So why, why do we have these? Um, in the liberal tradition, the idea here is that we have disagreements about what the basic, basic moral, cultural, and philosophical ideas about what the right way to live your life is. Um, the, the government shouldn't determine any one conception of what a good life is, um, that religious toleration and freedom of thought and conscience kind of preserve the idea that I can live as long as I am not harming you um, in any way, that my ability to, my choice of how I want to live my life shouldn't be up to the government, right? That the government shouldn't decide kind of questions of what the best way to live your life is, right? That the blue person, the orange person, and the green person can each have very different conceptions of what the, the meaning of life is, um, and the government shouldn't try to say that one of these is right or wrong. So the original constitution, um, as ratified, did not include the Bill of Rights. There were certain limitations on congressional power. Um, for example, they prohibited bills of attainder um, that, you, that Congress could not just pass a bill saying that you were guilty of a crime and that you would be put in prison or executed. Uh, it prohibited ex post facto laws, um, or the idea here of that, that you could be found guilty of a law that was passed after the actual commission of the crime. So like something that you did was legal when you did it, then the law changes and then you would be tried there. Um, or suspension of habeas corpus, the idea here being that um, you have to be charged with a crime. You have to be brought before a judge um, to be detained by the government. And um, Alexander Hamilton was actually skeptical of enumerating rights in a Bill of Rights um, because he, the idea is once you put like here are the things that the government can't do explicitly written down, then he was concerned that, that creates like um, potentials uh, for loopholes and exceptions and exclusions and that you were going to have people try to game the system. Um, but the Bill of Rights became part of the ratification debate, part of the debate between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. The Anti-Federalists were really worried that there wasn't an explicit protection of civil liberties. Um, and so part of what was promised um, in the ratification debate was this promise of a Bill of Rights, that we will amend the Constitution to include specific protections for civil liberties to prevent the federal government from becoming tyrannical. Now, the Bill of Rights as written only targets the federal government. It becomes, it's these, it lists things that the federal government cannot do. It doesn't have any sort of limits to the states. Um, part of the problem, part, part of the reason here is because at the time, many assumed that the states would be naturally more defensive of liberties for some reason. Um, and many states already had Bill of Rights into their state constitutions. 
Um, and so this becomes an obvious issue over time as um, with federalism, right? With states passing different laws, like, well, just because the federal government cannot violate the freedom of religion, what about state governments? Can this, uh, a state, an individual state have an established religion? Well, the 14th Amendment, it's the language that no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Um, and no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without the due process of law. These equal protection and due process clauses have been interpreted to mean that the Bill of Rights, the constitutional protections of rights, apply to the states. That, however, this is achieved through this process of what's known as selective incorporation, that it was not an automatic guarantee, but that the courts have in rulings on specific questions incorporated these rights to the state level, that they move, that they apply the Bill of Rights through this logic of the 14th Amendment to the state level. So this is an ongoing process. Um, but the idea here is that, and we'll talk about this when we talk about the Second Amendment, for example, that um, the Supreme Court recently ruled that the Second Amendment applied to state gun laws, not just federal gun laws. Um, and this is kind of, this is this process of selective incorporation, that it's not an automatic guarantee uh, that the Supreme Court, that the courts have to do this work of application. So let's look at some of the specific liberties uh, about Different, different liberties in the Bill of Rights. Um, in the First Amendment, there are two clauses about freedom of religion. The first is the Establishment Clause, and this is the prohibition of having a state-sponsored religion. Um, today, it has, is much more of a question over favoring one religion and law and policy over another, rather than having a state-sponsored religion, because there's not really anyone pushing for a state in, in mainstream politics pushing for a state-sponsored religion, it's more of a question of playing favorites to a government policy. In 1971, the Supreme Court uh, established in its opinion in Lemon versus Kurtzman, what's known as the Lemon Test um, to determine whether or not a law passed the, violated the Establishment Clause. Uh, and a, a law had to first, and this is a three-part test, avoid what's known as unnecessary, excessive or unnecessary entanglements. It might, in other words, that the boundary between government and religion should be relatively straightforward, that it should be pretty clear that this is not like the government interfering with religion. That second, it should be neutral. It cannot either inhibit or advance any particular religious practice. It should be neutral in its effects. And the law must have some secular purpose. Its primary justification cannot be religious in nature. Its primary justification has to be for the common good or some other non-religious justification for the law. And this often comes up in questions of education uh, with cases of um, funding for parochial schools and religious schools, the question of school prayer. Uh, and it's harder to separate because of the authority that teachers and school administrators have over their students. Um, so a lot of debates over the establishment clause will function in, are, are decided in this question of public education. The other religious freedom clause in the First Amendment is this idea of free exercise, that the, that the um, excuse me, that the federal government cannot restrict or control religious practice. And this has been applied to the rights of conscientious objectors in Gillette versus United States. Um, that that, that um, your is part of your your right to object to being drafted or participating in a war is protected under the free exercise clause. Um, and the in, in the Supreme Court case of Sherbert versus Verner um, established what's known as the the Sherbert test to determine whether or not a particular like Lemon test to determine whether or not the particular law violates the free exercise of uh, of religion. Um, the first is that the law has to have a compelling government interest. Um, if it's going to violate, if it's going to either inhibit or, or restrict religious practice, it has to have a compelling government interest. So if there was a religious practice that um, was deemed to be like very threatening to health and safety, such as in, ex uh, in extreme forms, obviously something like human sacrifice or child slavery, um, there's a compelling government interest to interfere in the free exercise of that religious practice. 
but it also has to be narrowly tailored. It has to be for this very specific purpose. It can't be like a broad restriction on all religious practices or all practices of a particular religion. Um, it has to be both very narrowly targeted and that target has to have a very compelling reason. So the burden of proof is on the government to prove that their intervention into, free, into religious freedom is justified. Now, in recent years, uh, both at the federal level and many state levels, have enshrined this Sherbert test as law through what are known as Religious Freedom Restoration Acts um, that have basically um, made it a legal standard as to how much the governments can interfere in um, in, in religious, free, in religious be, uh, practice. So for example, uh, Burrell versus Hobby Lobby um, famously held that companies did not have to provide contraceptive coverage if it violated their conscience. Um, that, that, um, and similarly, Masterpiece Kickship versus Colorado Civil Rights Commission are uh, held that bake shops can choose not to provide services to LGBTQ couples out of freedom of conscience. Um, these are all based on the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, based on this idea of uh, kind of shifting the burden of proof tore onto the government that they really have a higher threshold to meet to justify by uh, restricting religious practice. The First Amendment also ex protects various forms of freedom of expression, speech, press, assembly, and petition. Uh, and this, these questions really emerge in the 20th century with the development, the expansion and development of print media and various forms of communication. Um, and there's a series of doctrines that have emerged over time to determine what, to what extent is freedom of expression absolute. For example, in Schenck versus Ohio, um, the, uh, the clear and present danger doctrine uh, was, was enunciated that uh, distributing anti-war pamphlets that encouraged people to dodge the draft was a clear and present da danger to national security. Um, and so in, and, and so Schenck Shank's conviction was held. His his distribution of anti-war pamphlets was not protected under the freedom uh, freedom of speech clause. Um, later case uh, in the sixties, uh, Brandenburg versus Ohio held that directs calls to violence or law breaking, uh, and this uh, person was held was um, was 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 imprisoned for uh, a involvement in a, a meeting of the KKK, which included direct calls to violence, um, and that these. The, free, the First Amendment does not protect those. Um, there's also question, the idea of fighting words. While offensive and controversial free expression is often protected, uh, fighting words that incite violence or criminal action is not protected. Um, now, there's lots of more questions and debates over where, where should we draw this boundary. Uh, for example, um, there's pretty much been held universally that students have less than an absolute freedom of speech, especially at the, uh, the, the, the primary and secondary level. Uh, and there's lots of debates about like, well, what about speech that isn't quite direct calls to violence? Speech like um, the neo-Nazi march in Skokie, Illinois through a predominantly Jewish neighborhood in the 80s, um, or, more, or more recently, the Westboro Baptist Church picketing um, the funerals of fallen uh, soldiers and service members, um, in both of which many would consider not just offensive, but hateful and, like, and harmful forms of speech. Where do we draw this line? And, and, and this is kind of an evolving debate in the courts and in, 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 in society of like, how do we actually uh, determine what the limits of free speech are. The Second Amendment inclu uh, includes a, the protection of the right to bear arms, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Um, there's a lot of debate over what this text actually means. Um, for example, originally in the United case of the United States versus Miller, this was linked, the, the right to own firearms was linked to the well-regulated militia, that this, this was upheld, that, you, that, that this was not a universal right to own a firearm. This, was a, this is a narrowly construct, constructed right based on membership and participating in a well-regulated militia. That's been rolled back uh, in DC versus Heller. Uh, the, the court held that gun control laws may violate this right to own firearms that are owned for lawful purposes, such as self-defense. Um, and then in McDonald versus Chicago, more recently, um, the Supreme Court held that the Second Amendment protections are uh, apply to state laws, um, that, that, this, that the state of Illinois could not 
uh, could not impose laws that violated the Second Amendment. They could not impose a handgun ban in Chicago. So this is also an area of, of kind of contemporary debate of exactly what does it mean to infringe the right to bear arms? How far does that right go? To what extent can gun control regulation that isn't the, uh, the banning of firearm ownership violate this right? Another question involves the right to privacy, which is not an explicit right in the Constitution, but is grounded often in the Third and Fourth Amendments. The Third Amendment is the right against uh, being for having soldiers being forcibly quartered in your own home, and the Fourth Amendment protection against unreasonable search and seizures. Um, but the, the word privacy doesn't appear in the Constitution or the Bill of Rights. It has to have been inferred, uh, and it's inferred partially through the uh, many cases over um, sexual freedom and sexual liberty. In the case of Grin Grisold versus um, a Connecticut, it established the right of privacy by striking down a state law that made contraceptives illegal. Um, and slowly the sexual privacy was expanded to all couples. Uh, Roe versus Wade famously uh, held that the right to privacy includes the right to terminate a pregnancy, at least under certain criteria, um, such as fetal viability and pregnancy um, progress, uh, but there held there are no restrictions in the first trimester. Um, that, that framework was rolled back in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, uh, and it replaced the trimester framework with what is known as the undue burdens test, which allows restrictions prior to fetal viability, uh, restrictions or regulations on uh, abortion and, uh, and reproductive health care that are not uh, um, considered to be substantial obstacles on women seeking an abortion. So these are where you get things like uh, required ultrasounds or doctors having admitting pr privileges or certain or various um, medical regulations on different on, on healthcare clinics. Lawrence versus Texas uh, over, uh, overruled state laws that criminalize same uh, same sex uh, sexual relations, um, expanding this idea of sexual privacy to include your choice of sexual partner. Um, but privacy doesn't only, only have to do with sex. Um, it's also based on searches of the home uh, where there's a reasonable expectation of privacy requiring a search warrant that establishes probable cause. Um, this, is in, this is then expanded in that versus Ohio uh, that any evidence that's obtained without a warrant is inadmissible in court that you cannot use um, evidence that has been achieved through an unlawful search in the court of law. And the new frontier um, is kind of uh, pro uh, is communications technology. How far does our right to privacy extend here? Um, there is, it involves questions of um, from government and corporations. And there's not a ton of case law here, but in, uh, a recent case, Carpenter versus the United States, argued that uh, the Fourth Amendment does apply to phone location data. That the government cannot just seize phone location data from telecom uh, from from your cell phone provider um, without a warrant. Beyond the right to privacy, um, many of the Bill of Rights focus on the rights of due process or the rights of the accused of crimes. Um, the Fifth Amendment includes several rights, including the right to grand jury protections that, uh, that you that cases have to be the cases have, uh, that they're that to be charged with a crime you have to be indicted by a grand jury. Uh, prohibitions against double jeopardy being charged for the same crime twice once you are acquitted of that crime. Uh, criminally, at least, you cannot be charged for that crime again. Also includes, includes a, the right against self-incrimination that you have. The, this is the that you have the right not to test to choose not to testify at risk of incriminating yourself. Uh, this was expanded in the famous case of Miranda versus Arizona that suspects have to be are required to be informed of their right to, against self-incrimination. This is the Miranda rights that you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Um, it also includes property protection, such as uh, the takings clause, um, that any takings, that the, if the government takes any of your property, it has to provide um, compensation. This comes up a lot in environmental law, like does a, um, many have argued that environmental regulations constitute a takings because they require they require you to, to engage in certain forms of property modification that is expensive, uh, also in questions of eminent domain. The Sixth Amendment includes rights to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury, and this prevents indefinite contention, ensures fairness, um, and the right to challenge uh, jury members who would not be impartial, that you have the right to confront witnesses, you have the right to make a legal defense for yourself if you are charged with a crime, 
And this has been and you have a right to legal counsel in Gideon versus Wainwright, and the court held that anyone accused of a serious crime was entitled to a lawyer even if they could not afford them. So you have a right to a public defender if you cannot afford a lawyer. The Seventh Amendment uh, in includes the right to jury trial in civil, not just criminal law. It also separates uh, the matters of fact from matters of law, um, where the ap appeals are matter. This is the idea that you can appeal matters of law, but not matters of fact. The Eighth Amendment includes uh, prohibitions against excessive bail, um, as well as prohibitions against cruel, cruel and unusual punishment. Um, so various forms of torture and forms of execution have been challenged, uh, and there are current debates over the Eighth Amendment over the um, the death penalty more broadly, both in terms of the manner and for whom the state can be, can put to death. Now, civil liberties claims are political. It's important to think of these things as not just like rights that kind of exist in a vacuum. They are a claim upon the government, a demand that some right be respected. And the meanings of these rights is not uncontested. These are contested meanings of like what exactly is the right to is the right to the free exercise of religion. The court has been entertaining debates over what exactly constitutes a violation of my religious expression and a religious practice for hundred for, for, for decades now. And so the, the courts are trying to negotiate the meaning of that right. And that's why the courts are so important here. That question of constitutional interpretation that we talked about a couple of weeks ago really matters because how are you going to interpret the meaning or the purpose of the law and in the context of these constitutionally protected rights? Uh, and so there's a political process of negotiating the meanings of these rights, what these rights actually entail. Um, that the states and individuals are constantly um, constantly testing the precise boundaries of this zone of non-interference, where it should be broader or narrower. Are you right, have the right to say everything you want and anything, or is that right to free speech much narrower and circumscribed? And there are government regulations that are legitimate. These appeals on those meanings of these rights, these rights claims then get adjudicated by the courts, but courts don't settle things once and for all. They get incorporated into statutes um, that Congress passes laws kind of changing basically either solidifying a right or changing the law to kind of nullify uh, a court decision. They get incorporated at the state level and then they get challenged in the courts for future and by in future decisions. Um, and so civil liberties are deeply political, both in the sense that they are contestable and changing and, and the meaning are changing and the fact that, that what these when the courts settle on a particular meaning, it has effects on public policy. Certain policies become invalid because of an interpretation of, of, a, of, a, of a civil liberty, right? The, 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 the certain parts of the Affordable Care Act were, struck, were viewed as unconstitutional um, because they view, were viewed uh, determined to have violated the free exercise of religion of certain closely held corporations and religious institutions. So there are lots of politics involved in these civil liberties. They're not just kind of these generic kind of natural rights that kind of exist and are not uncontested. So this con there's a kind of constant contestation here that ends up kind of shifting these boundaries of rights and there's, they're never kind of settled once and for all. So next lecture, we are going to um, talk about immigration, who gets to be an American, uh, how, what is the immigration and naturalization process in the United States? How does immigration shape American politics and vice versa? So that's it for this lecture, I will I will uh, see you all for the next lecture uh, and then in discussion section this week. Take care.